a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. I'm uh, uh, looking forward to the uh, discussion. But before I, I would like uh, to sketch um, the Joint Council's proposal on how to enhance stability in the, your area. So uh, some years ago, we've uh, developed a proposal that was called uh, Maastricht 2.0. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that uh, in a couple of minutes. So as you know, uh, Europe at the moment is in a very fragile situation. So we have threats coming from many sides. We have the slowing down of the world economy. Monetary policy becomes increasingly ineffective. We have the danger of uh, Brexit. And we also have uh, a shift of, of political uh, parties. Uh, so uh, we are moving more towards parties that are opposing reforms and uh, consolidation. Uh, there is a political polarization uh, in many countries. And of course, we have the refugee crisis, which is one of the big challenges. And so we have to ask, how should we move forward in Europe? Do we need more integration, or do we need uh, a strengthening of the uh, existing uh, framework? And so, um, we believe that any proposal uh, that you can have uh, should respect the principle of the unity of liability and control. So those who take the decisions should also uh, take the responsibility uh, of the costs. And if you agree to that, then there are basically only two fundamental <coughs> options. So either you transfer fiscal and economic sovereignty to the European level, and then are also willing to assume joint liability. And this, of course, would mean that there would be a central decision-making uh, authority at European level, which would be able uh, to enforce tax increases, spending cuts, and also structural reforms. Or, alternatively, you, uh, you, uh, leave uh, you leave economic and fiscal sovereignty at the national level, but then you cannot have joint liability for government debt. So this is the no bailout clause, as somebody did the Maastricht uh, Treaty. And so uh, we've been discussing this issue a lot in the German Council, and we came to the conclusion that uh, currently uh, it's very unlikely that there's going to be a transfer of fiscal and economic sovereignty to the European level, because many European countries are uh, actually unwilling to give up their budgetary autonomy. And uh, if that is the case, then we're stuck with the second option. And that then means that we have to make sure that the no bailout clause is actually credible. And there are two ways to achieve that. You can uh, achieve it uh, ex ante by having uh, fiscal rules, such as the Stability and Growth Pact, which implies that uh, the euro area countries never get in a situation where they would have to be bailed out. Or, if it happens, you would need <coughs> to allow for a sovereign default, ex post. The reality, of course, looks a bit different. So we know that fiscal <coughs> rules were not enforced and are still not being enforced. In the crisis, sovereign default was largely avoided. And of course, the reason was that it was fear of contagion. And the sovereign exposures are still considered as risk-free in regulation, which, of course, is slightly inconsistent with the idea of the no bailout clause. So if we look at the evolution of uh, spreads of government bonds, so we can see that uh, uh, with the introduction of the euro, the spreads actually converged more or less uh, to zero, which meant that uh, any euro area country could borrow at more or less the same rate. Which, uh, given that fundamentals were still quite different, already seems to suggest that at that time the no bailout clause was not very credible. And uh, the fear is that if you, uh, if you have such a situation, that there is no market discipline, which means uh, that there are reduced incentives for consolidation <coughs> and structural reform. Then, of course, we had the euro area crisis, 
which can be seen as something like a wake-up call. So investors suddenly discovered that not all, not all Euro area countries uh, are the same. Uh, and uh, then we even got into this kind of self-fulfilling dynamics. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say that we can be ha happy that the ECB at that point uh, was able to calm down the situation by announcing uh, OMT. Of course, we have a lot of legacies from the crisis. So we've uh, seen this large increase in uh, public debt, which was uh, partly uh, due to the bank rescues. And Ireland, of course, is a, a very good example of a country that had uh, uh, relatively low debt levels before uh, the crisis and now has relatively high debt levels. Uh, in addition, what we see is that uh, consolidation has largely come to a halt in the <coughs> area in the recent years. And we also see that there is an increasing interlinkage between sovereigns and banks because in quite a few countries, uh, banks took the cheap liquidity from the European Central Banks and invested the money in uh, domestic sovereign uh, bonds, which means that uh, even though one of the, the goals of all these reforms was to mitigate the links between sovereigns and banks. Uh, here there's an instance where this actually was not achieved because uh, banks are now holding many more sovereign bonds on their balance sheet than they did uh, before the crisis. So uh, the German Council's proposal that was de developed a couple of years ago uh, has three pillars. So the first is fiscal policy, the second is the crisis mechanism, and the third is the financial framework, or the regulatory framework. And as you can see, uh, the, the fiscal policy is still a national responsibility, whereas the uh, financial framework is uh, a European uh, responsibility. And many of these things actually have been implemented uh, in, uh, similar to uh, what we envisaged. Uh, so one important component of the fiscal uh, policy pillar is the uh, low bailout law, in order to strengthen market discipline. And then, of course, there are all these uh, fiscal rules, the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, the Fiscal Compact, combined with the national debt breaks. As to the crisis mechanism, we, of course, now have the, uh, the ESM, European Stability uh, Mechanism, and in the uh, financial framework, we now have the European Banking Union. And I think it's important to say that all these are very important steps uh, forward in order to stabilize the euro area. However, there are two components in our view which are still missing. The one refers to the uh, crisis mechanism. The uh, second refers to financial regulation. Uh, regarding the crisis mechanism, uh, we still lack uh, um, an insolvency mechanism uh, for sovereigns, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. And regarding banking regulation, one of the big shortcomings uh, is, as I mentioned already, that sovereign exposures are still privileged in financial regulation. So let me talk about the two things uh, in turn. So what is the goal of a sovereign insolvency regime? The goal is to allow for an orderly restructuring of sovereign debt, with loss sharing by private uh, creditors, but at the same time without destabilizing the entire euro area. So that's uh, the idea. So it's very similar, in a sense, to the bail-in mechanism that we also have, uh, have for banks. And uh, so the idea is that you would like to re-establish market discipline, but you would like to avoid uh, things like uh, that happened in Greece, where you basically had to do all this in an ad hoc fashion, which certainly uh, was not uh, very uh, optimal and introduced a lot of uh, uncertainty. Uh, importantly, the restructuring of debt should always be combined with the macroeconomic restructuring program. So the idea would be that uh, if a country asks for an uh, ESM uh, program, there should also be immediately an analysis of the debt sustainability. And uh, depending on the outcome of that analysis, there would be an automatic lengthening of maturities, and if debt proves not to be sustainable, um, potentially a nominal uh, debt reduction. However, a debt restructuring of course is difficult if banks are holding 
a lot of sovereign debt on their balance sheets because then there's a problem that the debt restructuring would immediately also threaten <coughs> the solvency of the banking sector um, and um, uh, therefore maybe then the restructuring would uh, in the end never happen. And therefore we believe that a prerequisite for the implementation of a, so a sovereign insolvency regime is actually that we also remove the privileges um, for sovereign exposures in banking regulation. So uh, the goal would be to mitigate this nexus between the sovereigns and the, and the banks. And uh, in particular, it would mean that you would want to reduce the concentration risks in the bank's balance sheet. You would want to raise banks' absorption capacity and you would want to reduce price uh, distortions. As you know, there are a couple of privileges in current uh, regulation. So the large exposure limits don't apply to the sovereign exposures. There are no capital requirements according to risk. And there's also privileged treatment in the new liquidity regulation. So if you look at the concentration risk in bank balance sheet, and this is data uh, of the uh, last uh, EBA stress test. So Ireland is the second on the right. That's very small. So actually, Ireland doesn't have a uh, it doesn't seem to have a huge problem there. Belgium uh, has an exposure of more than 300 percent of the bank's uh, uh, equity uh, to sovereign um, counterparties. And uh, what you can also see is that there's a strong home bias. So most of these investments in sovereign bonds is in domestic sovereign. Uh, bonds. This is especially true for the southern periphery countries and uh, <coughs> Germany. If you look at the right hand side, this shows you what this actually implies in terms of risk. And of course, it makes uh, a difference whether you have a high concentration in German government bonds or, in, uh, let's say, in Portuguese government bonds. That makes, of course, a difference, and the, uh, the risks uh, coming from that uh, could be uh, very different. And therefore, our proposal um, regarding uh, the removal of, um, of privileges of sovereign exposures has two components. The first is a risk-adjusted large exposure limit, where the limit would depend on the country's credit worthiness. And the second is risk-weighted capital requirements, uh, where we would rely on the basal risk rates for sovereigns. And uh, this table here shows you the numbers. So the first column is actually uh, the base of risk rates for sovereign. So these, these risk rates exist. They're not just not being applied at the moment. Okay? And you can see if you compare it with the third column, you can see these risk rates are much lower uh, than for uh, corporations. And you also see that for uh, quite a few countries um, in the euro area, actually the, the base of risk rate would still be zero. Okay? For Ireland, it would be uh, 20 uh, 20%. Percent. Um, so these would be the risk rates, and the, uh, the next co uh, column shows the large exposure limit. So this would mean that any bank in the euro area could hold only 25% of their equity in Greek bonds, but they would be allowed to, to hold 100% of their equity, in addition to everything else they're holding, in, let's say, German uh, government bonds. So there would be a higher limit for um, sovereign bonds from a country with a higher rate. What would this imply? Of course, there would be large portfolio reallocations. And this would especially apply to Germany, Spain, uh, and uh, Italy. Of course, because these are, uh, these are very uh, big uh, countries. Overall, this would amount to uh, 578 billion euros. But these are, uh, this is the data from the stress test, so this only includes the significant banks. We should keep that in mind. It does not include the non-significant banks, because we don't have any uh, data for them. Regarding the additional capital requirements, the number is actually pretty small. So the additional capital requirements amount to only 35 uh, billion euros, which is 3% uh, of uh, own funds. We see there's a lot of heterogeneity across countries, so this would uh, mostly affect Italy and uh, Spain, and in relative terms, so compared to own funds, also uh, Portugal. But still, the number is relatively small. And uh, this also means that the additional loss absorption capacity that uh, you get by, um, by having this reform is, is relatively uh, small. So the really important measure is the large exposure. This matters a lot. The capital requirements are uh, of secondary uh, importance. 
Um, it's important when you implement some, uh, something like this that you need provisions against pro-cyclicality. We know that many regulations that we had before the crisis proved to be strongly pro-cyclical. And the proposal that we have here is that one should use uh, average values for the calculation of the large exposure uh, limits and the own funds in order to reduce this pro-cyclicality. And also, of course, you would need a long uh, transition phase in order to smoothen the transition to the new regime. Let me say a few words about uh, common deposit uh, insurance. So in uh, the view of the German Council, there are two important arguments why uh, now may not be the time to introduce common uh, deposit insurance. So first of all, there are still these very close links between the sovereigns uh, and the banks, which means that national policies may actually shift risks um, uh, from the national to the European uh, level. And second, uh, we have these, uh, this high legacy debt in the banking sector, and especially this large amount of non-performing loans. So in, in a sense, uh, before we can uh, actually think about introducing common deposit insurance, uh, uh, we, we need to take additional uh, measures. And two of them would be that we should remove the privileges for the, uh, the sovereign exposures. And the second is that we would have to solve the legacy debt problem in the banking sector. So let me say a few words um, also about the low interest rate environment, which of course is one of the topics of the week, given that uh, we're going to hear some news on, on Thursday about what's going on in monetary policy. Uh, so this graph uh, shows you the, uh, the euro area uh, yield curves. And what we see is that what happened over the past years, the first measures that were taken, they uh, mostly reduced the, the short run yield. Uh, but the more recent measures also reduce the long-term yield, which means that now the margin between long-term rates and short-term rates has been compressed quite uh, substantially. And that, of course, puts, a, puts pressure uh, on base earnings uh, who are earning money from doing maturity uh, transformation. And uh, it seems that uh, German banks uh, are going to be uh, hit quite substantially by this over the coming years. So at the moment, we don't see uh, so much uh, yet because a German bank typically uh, grants loans at fixed rates. So it takes some time until you really see it in the balance sheet. But there's a recent study by the German supervisor at Deutsche Bundesbank who shows that the profits of the smaller German banks uh, are going to uh, fall by between 25 and 75 uh, percent in the upcoming uh, five years, which is uh, quite uh, substantial. In addition, German life insurers will be hit uh, very hard by the low interest rate environment. You probably know that in Germany it's very common to have uh, these uh, long-term guarantee uh, products. And at the moment, the average guarantee rates on the, uh, on the products on the balance sheet are around 3%. You may imagine that it's not easy to earn that in the market. And so there will be uh, substantial problems also in the German life insurance uh, sector. So there's a fear that the drop in profit, uh, profit margins is going to set uh, incentives for uh, excessive uh, risk taking, people search for years. And in a sense, this is exactly what is intended by uh, monetary uh, policy. The problem, of course, is that even if you take higher risks at the moment, the return that you get is relatively small, right? So let's say you do a lot of maturity transformation with a relatively flat yield curve, then you take high interest rate risk, but the return you get is actually very small. And the same if you go into, into high yield bonds or whatever. A second issue is that there may be uh, asset price um, bubbles. So um, over the past years, we've seen sharp increases in stock markets in, um, in many countries. There's also been a correction recently. But, um, uh, what we've shown in our recent report is that this increase in stock prices over the past years can largely be explained by uh, the low interest rates. So in that sense, by a fundamental factor. But at the same time, what we see is, and especially when interest rates are very low, the sensitivity of stock prices to changes in interest rates is very, very high. And of course, monetary policy itself introduces uh, high volatility. So there's a picture of the 3rd of December 2015. So this is what happens uh, when uh, at the uh, <coughs> December uh, meeting uh, of the uh, Government Council of the uh, ECB. 
There could also be asset price bubbles uh, in, in housing, of course, an important issue also in, uh, in Ireland. We see that the evolution uh, of how house price has been uh, very heterogeneous across uh, the euro area, but we certainly see price pressure in certain regions and in certain uh, segments. At the same time, the credit expansion remains moderate, where you could say that maybe the problem is not uh, as severe. Um, we know very little about uh, commercial real estate. Most of the data that we have is on, on residential real estate. And the ECB, for example, argues that pressures are building up in the commercial real estate uh, market. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's still unclear how severe the threat uh, really is. So uh, if you ask me, are we, uh, is there a threat of a new financial uh, crisis? And I would say that if we uh, have this long phase of low interest rates, so it certainly threatens the business models of, uh, of banks, insurance companies, and so on. And there certainly at some point will be the uh, market exit of some institutions. But maybe uh, the, the scenario of a financial crisis would rather be one where interest rates go up again. So imagine, I mean, nobody can imagine that at the moment, but in a couple of years maybe, interest rates are going to go up again. And maybe they go up faster than expected. And then many financial institutions actually will be uh, in deep trouble. And remember that historically, most banking crises took place in an environment of rising interest rates and not of, of low uh, interest rates. And, um, and so I think that this would actually be the most threatening scenario, having a sharp interest rate increase after a long period of, uh, of low rates. So what are the challenges for regulation? What we uh, certainly need is a more comprehensive capital regulation of the interest rate risk in Pillar 1 of the Basel uh, Accord. Uh, we need limitation of lending by credit or credit-specific macro prudential instruments. And of course, Ireland is quite advanced in that respect. In Germany, such instruments at the moment don't even exist. There is always a danger of business being shifted uh, to the less regulated uh, sector, to the shadow banking uh, sector. And I'm personally skeptical that we will ever be able to fully regulate this. And therefore, I uh, do not think that financial stability in the end can be guaranteed by macroprudential uh, supervision uh, alone. Uh, and uh, at the moment, the ECB argues that financial stability was uh, should not be tackled um, by monetary policy, but only by macroprudential uh, supervision. Uh, however, we also see that this can lead to inconsistency. If, at the one hand, the monetary policy tries to, uh, to increase risk-taking in the economy, and on the other hand, then macroprudential policy is supposed to contain that risk-taking. And um, uh, therefore, I think that uh, the uh, ECB cannot ignore the consequences of its behavior on financial stability. And uh, if it were take, uh, uh, taking the, these risks for financial stability into account, uh, I think it would be clear that monetary policy should not be loosened uh, any further. So let me come to the conclusion. As I said in the beginning, Europe is in a very fragile uh, situation. And this makes it all the more important to strengthen the uh, architecture of the euro area. I believe at the moment it's unwise to push for, uh, for further uh, integration. That would be very difficult. But rather, we should try to strengthen the existing uh, structures in order to prevent a breakup in the next crisis. And I think a lot has been done. And we should continue uh, on, on the path that we've taken after the crisis, which would mean that we should continue fiscal consolidation and uh, improve the enforcement of fiscal rules. We should further improve the crisis mechanism, especially by introducing an insolvency mechanism for some rates. We should further strengthen the banking union, especially by removing the privileges for uh, sovereign exposures. But of course, all this will be, uh, will be difficult if we don't return to uh, economic growth. But the return um, of economic growth will largely depend on the implementation of structural reforms, which would be able to increase investor and consumer confidence. And we shouldn't ask too much from monetary policy in that respect. So thank you very much for your attention.